Somebody give the Lord a shout. Come on. Come on, put your hands together. Come on, let's see it. We waited for this day. We've gathered in your name, calling out to you. Come on, say your glory. Your glory like a fire, awakening desire is burning our hearts with truth. You're the reason, say. You're the reason we're here. Come on, say you're the reason. You're the reason we're singing. Say, open up the heavens. We want to see you open up the floodgates. Welcome in the place. Hallelujah. We want to welcome you all to Central on a Wednesday night. If you're visiting with us tonight for the first time, we welcome you. Uh, there's a Get Connected card on the back of your seat. If you want to fill that out and drop it in the bucket, that'd be great. And let us know of your visit. Also, let's give it up for our live stream audience. We are so glad you tuned in with us tonight. Do not touch that dial. Because you are in for it tonight. How many of you know that God's up to something right here at Central? There's a shift going on. It's going on. It ain't coming. It's going on right now. When you get 50 men in a Bible study for four weeks in a row, God's up to something. Amen? When you get 50 women in a Bible study on a Sunday night, God's up to something. So if you miss the shift... Don't miss the shaking. Amen? Because after the shift, there's always a shaking. God's going to shake you. Get ready. We're in a new season. 
We're in a new season in the natural, and we're in a new season in the supernatural. If you don't sense, see, I see an abundance of rain coming. Amen. I see chains falling, and I see an army rising up right here at Central Community Church. Amen. Come on, give God another shout of praise. I've got just a couple of announcements, that, uh, and I hope I get these right because they come to me like three minutes ago. Uh, October. Y'all say October. The whole month of October is Pastor Appreciation Month. Y'all, come on, give it up for our pastors. Y'all, we are so blessed. We love you guys, but on October the 4th, y'all say October the 4th, we are going to recognize our pastors for Pastor Appreciation Day. There's going to be baskets in the back. There's going to be baskets in the parking lot. There's going to be baskets on stage. No, I'm just kidding. There's going to be baskets in the back. Y'all bring your best gift. Because I'm going to tell you, they're worth every dime. They're worth every card. They're worth every thank you. So y'all come on, give it up for our pastors one more time. Also, if you're in this building right now, and you are a middle schooler or a high schooler, we have Revo going on down the hill. Katie is in the back. She's waving her hand. Y'all turn around. Do I have any middle schoolers or high schoolers in the building? Okay, we good. We good, Katie. They ain't coming. But anyway, we have Revo every Wednesday night. So send your high schoolers down, down the hill. Pastor Brandon's great with those kids and all those volunteers. They're awesome. So let's take a moment and let's go to the Lord in prayer. Father, we come to you tonight in the mighty, powerful name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth. Lord, we are thankful to be in your house tonight. We are thankful that we have a voice. We are thankful that we can come and lift up the name of Jesus as high as he can be lifted. And right now, Father, we give you honor and we give you praise and we give you glory for everything that's going to take place on these grounds tonight. God, I ask that you anoint this praise team as they lead us in worship. Father, I ask you now to touch Pastor Donna as she brings the word with a fresh and new anointing that she has not yet experienced. Father, we just give you glory and honor and praise. Touch our youth, our children. May everything that has breath in this place tonight give you praise. And it's in Jesus' mighty name we pray. Turn around and greet two or three people behind you, beside you. Give them that high five wave in Jesus' name. Amen. Come on, everybody. Jimmy, you're sounding good back there tonight. Holy, say, holy, say, holy. Father, you are holy. There is no one else like you. Come on, y'all, say it. You are faithful, yeah. Faithful, faithful. Father, you are faithful. We have put our trust in you. Our God, say our God who reigns. We praise your
in this house right here. Lord, we magnify your name. Lord, we shout unto you tonight. Yes, we do. Everybody say hallelujah. We praise your name. victory tonight, yeah. Lord, we bless you with our praise. Yeah. Come on, take about 30 seconds and give him a praisey praise in here on Wednesday night. Come on, somebody praise him right here. Somebody shout unto him right here because he's worthy of our praise. Hold on right there, Jimmy, just for a second. You know, I came in here tonight and uh, I usually don't mess up this bad, but didn't schedule a drummer for tonight. I know. I know that's horrible. How are you going to have music without a drummer? But just then when we ended up this song, the Lord just kind of spoke to me and said, why do you need a drummer tonight when you've got about 150 people? Listen, when in reality is he loves the drums, but what, it, what makes it awesome is he's searching for some of you to worship him in spirit and in truth tonight. So if we don't have drums, guess what we do have? We have our hands and we have our feet. Oh, I know, y'all not, y'all not, well, wait a minute, they pay you to do that. No, 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 no. If you have breath, let everything that has breath praise the Lord. So if you're not praising them, you must be dead tonight. Come on, no, I'm just kidding. You're not dead, you look great, everybody's good. All right, I'm not getting on to you, I'm just saying... What would happen if we all in unison tonight gave him a crazy praise for about 30 seconds? I know you're waiting on me to start a song, but all I, all I got is this Falcon fan over here. And I need a little bit more than that because where two or three are gathered, he said, I'm right there in the middle. Is there anybody that has a reason to praise him tonight? Give him a shout about the, come on. Come on, come on, come on, come on. Oh, we all should be dead and we should be in a ditch somewhere, but tonight we're not. We're right here in the best place in all the country, Central Church. Come on, look at your neighbor and say, I'm in Central tonight. I know, I've gone over. I shouldn't speak so much. Let's go into the next song. Come on, y'all, let's lift our hands and worship him. I know there's some hurting people here tonight, and God has got you. Come on, say that. Say, God's got me. Yes, he does. Oh, we thank you in this place, Lord, that your presence was here before we ever got here. Hallelujah. Are you hurting and broken within? Overwhelmed by the weight of your sin? Jesus is calling.
love you with our worship. Come on, say this. Oh, what I say. Lord, we thank you, Lord, that you're calling us right now to worship you. Lord, and we just love you with our worship. Come on, we love you with our song. Lord, we love you with our worship. Come on, just do that right here. Just lift up your hands and just love on him with your song. Say, I love to worship you. Come on, this is real easy. Just say, I love to worship you. Come on, that's all it said. Sing it to him. Say, I love to worship you. Lord, I love to worship you. Lord, we love to worship you. Tell him, say, I love to worship you. Lord, I love to worship you. Oh, I love to worship you. Come on, one more time. Everybody say now, Lord, I love to worship you. Lord, I love to worship you. Lord, I love to worship you. And I love to worship you.
Come on, tell him, say, I love to worship you. I love to worship you. And because he lives, I can face tomorrow. I can face tomorrow. Come on, y'all sing because he lives all fear. Because he lives all fear is gone. All fear is gone. Because I know, because I Come on, say, my life is worth, my life is worth the living just because he lives, because he lives. Come on, sing it one more time. Because he lives and because he lives. Come on, Central. I can face tomorrow. I can face tomorrow. Because he lives, because he lives. All fear is gone, all fear is gone. Because I know, and because I My life is worth the living just because he, here I am to worship, here I am to bow down, here I am to sing your life. Come on, sing it loud now. Your own. Sing it again. time I want to hear you say here I am to here I am to your
love him, give him a hand tonight. Amen? Amen. Praise God. Thank you, Jesus. Amen. Amen. Good morning. Good. Whoa. Good. I say good morning because it looks like Sunday morning in here. Thank you. You may be seated. Good afternoon. Wednesday afternoon. Yes. Good night. I think y'all got your days confused. Good to see everybody tonight. Great looking crowd tonight. Good to be in the house of the Lord. Amen. Praise God. God is so good. I'm excited. I'm excited about the word tonight. And uh, I kind of took the advice we talked about last week. We talked about, of course, we're still in our Route 66. Y'all know that. Amen. We started, we started, I wrote down, we started um, September 2019. And it looks like we're going to finish. I actually wrote the date down. It's March or April of 2021. So that's been a, it's been a route. That's been a route, ain't it? <laughs> Amen. It's been great. I've enjoyed every minute of it. Amen. Praise God. God is good. But I decided to take the advice that Jesus gave us last week. We talked about how Jesus uh, called his disciples and how he built a team. Y'all remember? Man, we talked, okay, we're going to take a test. Who can tell me? No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> but uh, to take my own advice, and I, I picked a team. Amen? Pick me a team. Got some help up in here tonight. So uh, got some guys that's going to help me, guys and girls, that's going to help me tonight. And we're talking about miracles this week. I told you when we went through Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, when we talked about Matthew, we talked about Jesus, the King, the Messiah, amen? And uh, we talked about his birth, his genealogy. Uh, last week we did talk about how he began his ministry, the call of his disciples, how he picked that team, and how they served him faithfully, amen? And this week, I told you, we're going to talk about miracles, everything. Are y'all, does anybody still believe miracles can happen? <laughs> Woo-wee! I absolutely, absolutely believe that they can still happen, and I believe we're set up for them tonight. Amen? Amen. We are set up for them. Not, we were talking this week, not every miracle is a healing. It, it may be a situation in your life that is so messed up that you think, you know, it's going to take a miracle for, from all the things to work together that need to work together. God can do that. Amen? He's the same yesterday, today, and forever. And what he did then, he can still do today amen i believe that with all my heart so i've got some help where are my helpers i said y'all follow me y'all remember those two words follow me when i come up so come on up let's give these guys a hand tonight amen y'all just sit anywhere you need to sit i'm gonna move that in just a minute and uh, what we're gonna do each one of us because i thought i could talk about the miracles we could take the whole night and i could talk about each miracle but i thought wouldn't it be great for you to get another perspective on the miracle. So I, I called these guys this week. I said, look, I want you to take your favorite miracle. that you, And I just want you to take 30 minutes. Okay? So each one, they're going to take 30 minutes. And then I get my 30 minutes. <laughs> and so it, we're going to be a little long tonight. So I hope you brought a snack. And uh, no, I told them. I said, let's, do, let's try to do 10 minutes or under. And so that's a little bit of a challenge for some of these guys. But uh, one in particular. But, uh, <laughs> but uh, we can do it. I mean, miracles can happen tonight. Amen? And so I'm believing that they're going to take about 10 minutes, tell you, talk about their favorite miracle, relate it to us today, and then I'm going to talk about one, and we're going to end this thing up. And I believe, I believe God's I'm excited about the word that's going to come. I'm excited about this tonight. They're going to relate it to us today, and uh, it's going to be awesome. So are y'all ready for that tonight? Yeah. Let's pray. Father, we love you tonight. Thank you for your presence. Anoint us now. Lord, I thank you for these three people, Lord, that, that are on my team, Lord. I thank you. Lord, I know they have prayed. I know they have sought you today. And, Lord, I'm asking you now to anoint the words that they have to say. Speak to us as only you can in this time, Lord. We thank you and we praise you for it now in Jesus' name. First up tonight, ladies first, amen. So we got Miss Frances Anthony. She's going to come tonight and she's going to share with you what god has laid on her heart then we got brother ray Britton. he's going to come after that we got brother jason barrett he's going to come after that and i'm going to finish this thing up and we're going to have a great night amen, amen. pastor jason will you move that over there for me thank you come on miss francis give her a hand y'all praise the lord everybody praise the lord everybody all right it's a blessing to be in the house of the lord tonight amen and um i'm going to get right to it because um I got 10 minutes, and we're, going to, we're just going to roll with this. 
Um, there's something that I've, I've just been waiting to tell you guys, though, about what I'm talking about today. You know, usually when you hear someone speak, yay, you know, they lead you up to the main point and then they s hit you with it, but I just got to tell you what it is right now, the punchline, okay? And I'm going to say the punchline, and then I want you guys to tell me the punchline, okay? Jesus is the answer to what ails us. Is that all right? Can we say that together? Jesus is the answer to what ails us. Okay, tonight I'm going to be talking about one of my favorite stories in the Bible, miracles that Jesus performed, was Jesus healing Jairus' daughter. And um, when I was reading it, it's found in Luke, the eighth chapter, and it starts with, at the 40th verse. I'm not going to read a lot. I'm not going to read through it, but I'm going to kind of tell you what happens. But I want you to go and read this. Luke 8, um, the 40th verse, down through the 56th verse. But Jesus had just returned to the city, and there was this ruler. He was a ruler of the synagogue named Jairus. And Jairus' daughter was sick unto death. So he went out to meet Jesus. You know, they, Jesus was in this crowd of people that were waiting. This, they were waiting for Jesus to come back because they had needs, and they just, they just wanted to be where Jesus was. And, and Jairus felt like, okay, I need, I, I'm in desperation here. And I don't know if Jesus, if Jairus actually, um, as a synagogue leader, we know when we read the Bible that the leaders of the synagogues, many of them, they did not believe the teachings of Jesus. They did not believe in the authority of Jesus Christ. But it goes to show you that when you're in a desperate situation, and Jairus was in a desperate situation, so he went to see this Jesus. At the, apparently, he believed that Jesus was the only one that could answer his need. Because you, it says in that scripture that he went down, he was at the feet of Jesus, asking him, please come and heal my daughter. She's sick unto death. So Jesus agreed to go follow him to his house to heal his daughter. But on the way there, in the throng of people, there was a woman there that had an issue of blood. And she had been sick for 12 years. And had, the Bible says that she had spent everything that she had on doctors trying to be healed. But she made a decision that day even though she should not have been out among the crowd with this issue, and she definitely should not have been touching Jesus, a Jewish, a, a, a Jewish priest, she should, should not have been touching Jesus. But I think um, this woman, she had the attitude of Esther. If I die, let me die. I am going to touch the king, or I'm going to be touched by the king. And that's what she did. She pressed through that crowd. And she touched the hem of Jesus' garment. And when Jesus felt that touch, he knew something, something had happened. You know, the, the disciples tell him, oh, Jesus, you know, you look at all these people. What do you mean somebody's touching? Jesus, no, not that kind of touch. This was a different kind of touch. Something came out of me. Something flowed from me when this touch came. And that's how we have to be with Jesus. We have to touch Jesus in a way. When we reach out and we touch Jesus from our heart, when we connect with God, she was in an unclean condition, an unclean situation. But Jesus, no matter what situation you find yourself in, no matter how unclean your condition may be, if you can connect with Jesus, he will heal you, he will deliver you, he will set you free. So the miracle here was the miracle of salvation. Jesus saved her because she was in desperation. So we have Jairus and we have the woman, both of these both of these individuals were desperate. They needed a touch from Jesus. But as Jesus began to go along, and the people were still throwing him, he's dealing with the woman here, they come and give him the message. You know, you know, tell Jairus, don't worry, don't worry, don't worry, Jesus. Just, you know, your daughter's dead. You know, you know the ones that bring you the bad report. You know, they say, you know, you know it's over for you. It's, it's done, it's through, it's finished. You know, just, just let Jesus stay right where Jesus is and go ahead and live your life from this point forward. Jairus could have said, Jesus, you know, I'm sorry to have bothered you, but I'm, I'm just going to accept this. But he allowed Jesus. Jesus told him, don't fear. Don't worry. She, she's going to be healed. Don't worry. He trusted in Jesus because he was desperate. He was desperate for something from Jesus. So Jesus went on, followed him on to his house. And what I like about this scripture and it's in, if you look in your Bibles, it's in um, the 40, I'm sorry, um, the 51st verse. When Jesus got there, Jesus dismissed all the unbelievers, the skeptics, 
the naysayers, the haters, the fickle-minded, and the nosy people. He put them all out the house. Because what Jesus was about to do in that house, he needed it to be filled with believers. Those that believed, those that had a vested interest in what he was going to do in that young girl's life. And when Jesus shut that door and when Jesus spoke to her, they went outside and they were laughing one minute. They were crying and wailing and boo-hooing. You know, oh, it's, you know oh, the poor little girl, she's gone and, and miserable, miserable, miserable. But when Jesus told them, she's not dead, hush up all that fuss. This child is only sleep. Hush. And they went outside and they began to mock him, laughing. And you know, oh, you know, Jesus looking, you know, he's going in there. You know, they didn't, they didn't believe. They didn't have a vested interest in what Jesus was doing. But Jesus went along and he went in there and he spoke the word over that girl's life. And when Jesus spoke and he told her to rise, what did she do? She rose. She didn't have any choice because Jesus spoke. She rose. And she rose up and, and, and he told his parents, get her something to eat. Her parents were amazed, were astonished. And when I look back at this scripture and I think about when Jairus, when he was on the way there and when Jesus stopped to help this woman with the issue of blood, you know, sometimes in our path, in our journey, we have interruptions, we have delays. But sometimes I believe we have necessary interruptions in our life. You know, I don't know what type of heart uh, Jairus had towards Jesus. I don't know if he had any type of relationship, really, if he really accepted Jesus or he was just desperate. Anyway, when you, when you call and you reach out to Jesus, he's there, he'll answer. But what I see when, that he was, he was desperate, but what I know about Jairus is that even though it was a delay, him seeing Jesus heal this woman had to be an encouragement, had to build confidence in his faith. So we have faith. So when you face your situations in life, and it seems like, you know, I, I can't make it, look around, look at your sisters and brothers, maybe you have walked through something where Jesus has healed, Jesus has delivered, Jesus has set them free. Be encouraged, allow that to boost your faith. That's what we need, we need the faith of Jesus Christ. We need the faith of Jesus Christ. So all that I'm saying tonight is that Jesus is the answer to what ails us. No matter your condition, people, Jesus called a dead thing. The little girl was dead, but Jesus called her alive. Jesus will bring dead things back to life. Because Jesus is the what? What? Jesus is the what? Answer to what ails us. Praise God. I love you all. Can you hear me? That's good, Miss Francis. That, it, that was perfect that you said that. Uh, the woman with this year, but I, my uh, we, Miss Donna called me. Pastor Donna called me. She said, you know, well, she texted me and uh, wanted to know would I get up and speak on what is my my favorite miracle of Jesus. And it, it just so happens, I mean, I've been kind of looking at this, and it's the same exact word. This you're gonna like this. Uh, is the is the cru the crucifixion, the resurrection, the resurrection of Christ? There's, there's so much in the resurrection of Christ that we miss. I mean, we we hear it once a year as our Easter Sunday, Easter service, uh, and there's so much in the resurrection and the ascension of of. It's not just the crucifixion. We we get so focused on the crucifixion that we miss so much that was going on. I mean, this is the national championship of football, college football, the Super Bowl of all football games, guys. This, everything was all prophecy. Everything was leading up to this. And here it was, you know, Jesus is crucified. He goes into the tomb. And we know the story. We've heard it year after year. I mean, we know what, we know what happened. But I want to show you some things that, that, that I guarantee you've missed. And this is the coolest thing to me when, I heard a pastor uh, teaching on this, and uh, the first time I ever heard it, it, it blew me away because I've heard it and heard it, and it never made sense to me. So I want you to look at John chapter 20. We're going to go to verse 11. <clears throat> John chapter 20, verse 11. And it said, Now Mary stood outside the tomb crying as she went. She bent over to look into the tomb. I'm going to give you some little nuggets here along the way, okay? And then I'm going to close this thing out. And I didn't see what time it was, but I thought I'm going to go with it. So, 
All right. Now Mary stood outside the tomb crying as she went, and she bent over to look into the tomb and saw two angels in white seated where the body of Jesus had been, one at the head and one at the foot. The little nugget right there that you miss, that is a perfect image of the Ark of the Covenant. They asked her, woman, why are you crying? They have taken my Lord away, she said, and I don't know where they have, laid, they have put him. At this, she turned around, and she saw Jesus standing there. And this, this is what puzzled me for years, and it still does. Something, something happened there. She had been with Jesus two years, two and a half, three years in his ministry. Here was a man. Now, she even helped in the, in the, in the burial of, of Jesus. So she had saw, his, you know, I've heard some, some people say, well, he had been beaten, and that's why. She, she did not realize that it was Jesus as she turned around and saw him. And he asked her, woman, why, why are you crying? Who is it that you're looking for? Now, listen to me, ladies. Y'all need to hear this because the next time you sing Graves to Garden, it'll, it'll mean something to you. Uh, thinking he was a gardener. Now, where's she at? She's at a, at a tomb. Okay? Now, think back for me. What happened in the garden? It got turned to a grave with a woman first. Now, who is the first person Jesus comes back to after the resurrection as a woman? So she, she turns around, and she doesn't, she's thinking he's a gardener. So something, Jesus, some way, somehow, she doesn't recognize him. And she doesn't recognize his looks, and she doesn't recognize his voice. Okay? It's, it's, it's strange to me. She said, sir, if you have carried him away, tell me where you have put him, and I will get, and I will get him. Jesus then... He says to her, Mary, and she realizes instantly it's him. And she says, she turned toward him and cried out in Aramaic, Rabboni, which means teacher. And this is the key. This is what I want you to hear right now. Jesus said, do not touch me. The same in Greek, that word in, in Greek, uh, in some versions it says, in, in your version it says, do not, does not, do not hold on to me. In certain versions it says, cling that is the same in Greek. That touch means clean. It is, the, it is used several times, but one of the most, most notorious times is what Miss Francis was talking about, the clinging of the garment. Uh, there was power in that touch. Do not touch me, for I have not yet where? So where, let, me, let me stop. Where had Jesus been? Okay. I always wondered that. Where had he been? Ephesians tells us he descended. He descended and took captivity captive. Okay. Now he's coming back, but he made a pit stop. And we miss that so many times. And he tells her, do not touch me, for I have not yet ascended to the Father. Go instead to my brothers and tell them, I am ascending to my Father and your Father, to my God and your God. So Mary goes. Now I want to show you this real quick. Verse 19 on the evening of that first day of the week, it's the same day when the, that evening the disciples were together. The doors were locked. Now, where are the men at? I'm serious. Jesus knew if you had to get something done, you had to go, you had to, you had to go to a woman get it done. Okay? <laughs> I'm just going to say that. The men are in the house with the doors locked, and she's out there going to the grave site. She gets to see Jesus first. So there they are with the doors locked. Jesus came and stood among them and said, Peace be with you. After he had said this, he showed them his hands and his side, and the disciples were overjoyed and they saw him. In other words, he's showing them. He's not telling them, Hey, don't touch me. Don't touch me. He's not saying that. In fact, Thomas, even he tells Thomas to touch him. Okay? Before, he's telling Mary, Don't touch me. Don't touch me. We're getting a glimpse of something that we miss. And, and to me, I'm telling y'all, this is the greatest miracle that ever happened because our salvation come from this. And again, Jesus said, Peace be with you. As the Father has sent me, I am sending you. And so we see that he, where had he been? He had actually ascended to the Father. But I'm going to show you something else, and then I'm going to close. Go back to Matthew. I hope I can find it. I've always, this, this is always, me and my wife's talked about this. Okay, so Jesus descended, he ascended, he, before the ascension, he makes a pit stop and stops and talks to Mary, uh, but I want to read you this. All right, so Matthew 27, verse 50, 
50, we'll start at 51 real quick. At that moment, the curtain of the temple, I mean, this is when the crucifixion was going on. The temple was torn, I mean, the, uh, the temple was torn in two from top to bottom. The earth shook, the rock split, and the tombs broke open. The tombs broke open. The bodies of many holy people who had died were raised to life. Now listen, this is where this is where this is the key to this. They came out of the tombs after Jesus' resurrection and went into the holy city and appeared to many people. Think about that. They didn't come out until the resurrection. Jesus makes the stop. He's got this group of people with him, the saints. And if you go to Hebrews, I'm going to give you this real quick. You go to Hebrews. Uh, Hebrews 9, 12 tells you that what, where he's going. But there's a verse, and I had it wrote down somewhere, that he took the great cloud. Of, they, this is the great cloud of witnesses, okay? He's got them with him. They make a pit stop, and he says, guys, hold on one second. We're going, we're going somewhere, but i got to make something right first. And he addresses Mary and makes things right. Go tell them I'm coming. I've already told them back in John 14 that a little while I'll be with you, and a little while I'll be gone, but I'm coming back. Okay, and so here he is, he makes a stop, and all of these Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, they're walking around. I mean, can you imagine? Uh, what a miracle. Uh, and so then, of course, he ascends, if, and this, is, this to me is, is awesome. Wouldn't it be cool if you had, if the Bible would had a piece of scripture in there that told you of that? I'm going to read it to you real quick, and then I'm going to close. Daniel 7, 9, real quick. Oh, let me find it. Daniel 7, 9. Daniel has a vision, and there's four beasts in this, in this dream that he has. And you've got to understand that Daniel, it's, it's, a, it's a complicated book for a simple mind like me, but he can see things in the future. Now, we're always thinking that he's seeing things way beyond where we are now, but he could see things all along. And so in verse eight, uh, verse uh, 9, he says, As I looked, thrones were set in place, and the Ancient of Days took his seat. That's God. His clothing was as white as snow. His hair, the hair of his head was as white as wool. His throne was a flaming fire, and his wheels were all ablaze. The river of fire was flowing, coming out from before him. Thousands upon thousands attended him. Ten thousand times ten thousand stood before him. The court was seated and the books were open. Go down to verse 13. In my vision at night, I looked, and there before me was the one like the Son of Man coming with the clouds of heaven and approached the Ancient of Days and was led into his presence. He was given authority, glory, and sovereign power. All nations and people of every language worshipped him. His dominion is an everlasting dominion that will not pass away. And his kingdom is one that will never be destroyed. We think of that as, as later to come. That happened on resurrection so on, on when he ascended. That's Jesus coming before the throne with the cloud of witnesses right there. To me, that's my favorite. That is my favorite uh, miracle in the Bible. There is so much. Ten minutes don't do it no justice. But I hope you guys got something out of that. Thank you. Amen. Wow. Some powerful stories in it. Thinking about the thread that runs through this whole thing. What a what an incredible st you have the woman with the issue of blood. You have Jesus and his ascension. <clears throat> the thing that stuck to me was I don't know why, I actually my first choice actually was another one. And then the thing, you know, things just started shaping up, and, and the Holy Spirit started talking to me about the, um, the wedding at Cana. <clears throat> this is Jesus' first recorded miracle. It's recorded in John chapter 2. It's the only place it's recorded in the Gospels. But what happens is, is that he turns the water into wine. You know the story. It's funny because there, there's this big word called hermeneutics. Hermeneutics means the law of first mention. The law of first mention says that the first time something's recorded that it has some significance that you need to pay attention to. 
It actually supersedes any other time it's mentioned in the Bible. And this was the first miracle recorded. It doesn't mean it's the most powerful miracle. It doesn't even mean it's the best miracle. What it means is it says there's something here you need to draw into. You need to dial into. Don't just glance over this. It's interesting that it's the first miracle because, honestly, this is not something real important. I mean, this is a wedding feast, and they ran out of alcohol, and they call on Jesus to come and make sure they have enough wine left, right? Like, you know, it's not like somebody needed sight or they needed a, you know, a tra blood transfusion or, or Jesus, you know, healing the masses and coming forth. I mean, this was, this was just a human need, you know. This, is, this boiled down to reputation and their culture of the day and their needing. See, there's some ingredients here. When Jesus shows up on the scene, if you have lack or a crisis, that's where miracles show up. You can't have a miracle without having a crisis. You can't have... You can't draw anything out of Jesus until there's some lack or need. And we had all of these. Let's just go to the scripture here. It says in John chapter 2, verse 1, it says, On the third day, everybody say third day. That's significant. A wedding took place at Cana in Galilee, and Jesus' mother was there. Jesus and his disciples had also been invited to the wedding. When the wine was gone, Jesus' mother said to him, They have no more wine. He said, woman, why do you involve me? Jesus said, my hour has not yet come. This was not even on Jesus' calendar. This, listen, sometimes it's a faith like Mary's. She did not care. Her next response is, his mother said to the servants, do whatever he tells you. She just walked away. Sometimes if you need to get what you need to get from Jesus, you, you got to get the voices out of your head that says, there's somebody dying of cancer right now, and, and my little situation really, I, I, I sh I'm not even worthy to come before him. But, but listen, Jesus has got enough to go around. Now, this miracle, it came because his mom spoke and told the servants, do whatever he tells you, and she left the room. But this was not on Jesus' calendar, but sometimes you can get, he, you can get Jesus off of his calendar and onto your need. It only takes us having some faith. But there's some things in this ingredients here I'm going to run through real quick. Woman, why do you involve me, Jesus said. Then let's go to verse 6. He said, nearby six stone water jars were there. The kind used for the Jews by the, it was a ceremonial washing, each holding from 20 to 30 gallons. These were massive cisterns. And they were used when the Jews would come ceremonially to cleanse themselves of unrighteousness and sin and things like that, or to wash themselves. I mean, this was, there was a reason why these were used. And Jesus gave them instruction. He says, go fill these jars with water. Notice that this was just interesting to me. This is a side note. It says they fill them to the brim. Jesus didn't say fill these up as full as you can get them. But there's something in these servants that they played part in this miracle. And we can learn something from this. See, sometimes you and I are the servant. Sometime you and I are the servant. The word is spoken. We have the word, but we don't believe the promise. And we don't go all in. We're, we're not wholehearted. But, but they did what we need to do. We need to learn from this is that when, when Jesus told them what to do, they did it with everything they had. They left no more room. They filled them to the brim. Would have made their job harder because honestly, carrying these cisterns around full of water, that was heavy. They filled them to the brim. It says, then Jesus told them, now, draw some out and take it to the master of the banquet. Now, I've read on past this a few times in my life, but something stopped me in my tracks just the other day as I was preparing for this. And I was like, you just think about this a minute. You have these servants, and they have the, the, the whole wedding feast. And, and believe me, there's a stir going on. There's some, there's some people talking. The wine is out, and it's a crisis situation at the time of this wedding. And here the servants are. Their reputation is on the line. And Jesus says, draw some of that water out and go take it to the master of the banquet. This master, just so you know, to set this up, he would, he's an expert in everything that involves wine. He knows the wine from every area of that nation. He knows what it is. He knows what it's not. And, and these men are thinking, you mean to tell me you want me to draw water out and take it to the master of the banquet as if this is going to be somehow we're going to get over on them? But this is the next ingredient that has to show up. It's blind obedience. If you want to draw something out of Jesus, you've got to have blind obedience and you forget what you know. 
Otherwise, Peter would have never cast his net on the other side. He was a better fisherman than Jesus. But he knew that he needed to listen to his voice. That's all he had ever done. Sometimes we got to forget what we know. The servants might have knew a little bit about wine, and they might have knew a little bit about this master of the banquet, but instead they draw the water out. And here's the miracle. On the journey from the cistern to the master of the banquet, that sloshing out, it's water. He can see it. He knows it's water. I'm walking with it. it, it you see, you've got to walk by faith and not by sight because all you see is water. But Jesus said, take it to him. That's what I'm going to do. It's spilling out. I see it's water. My hands are trembling because my reputation is on the line. Everybody's going to think I'm a fool, but I'm doing what I was told. I'm going to obey because besides the woman said, do whatever he tells you. That ingredient of faith and obedience comes together, man. And when Jesus shows up in the middle of those two things, amazing things happen. The master of the banquet takes the wine and he drinks it and he says wait a minute whoa whoa it says he doesn't I, I don't know where this comes from it wasn't from that part of the land he knew that he says to the bridegroom he says most people they 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 bring out the cheap wine after everybody's had their expensive stuff but why have you done this you saved the choice it was choice wine he said you saved it for last now, that's one aspect of the story. But let me tell you why it's important. What Jesus may have been finding out himself in that moment, God was revealing something to him. You and I are the water. Water is hydrogen and oxygen. It's a very simple, just basic, complex molecular structure. There's nothing crazy about it. But wine is a whole nother thing. Doesn't even look the same. If you look at it at its molecular level, there was a transformation that took place. It wasn't like the water turned color of wine. The water became wine. See, water, you can spill it all over you, drink it. It's free. It's nothing about water. You can, you can just casually drink water. But you got to prepare for wine. Wine is something that is heavy and weighty. In your body, it actually will consume you. In, in wine, you can come under its influence. Wine is intoxicating. Jesus referred to himself as the fruit of the vine, the grape that begins the process, crushed and squeezed. Jesus was learning something about his destiny. If he didn't already know, God was revealing to us in this moment that water, you and I, you know, our bodies are mostly water. We're made up of water. But when you put Jesus' blood into the scenario, there is a transformation that takes place in us. We used to be just basic in hydrogen and oxygen, but now there's a structural change at the base level, something from the very grounding foundation of our lives. There is a, have you ever seen a real transformation I mean, have you ever seen somebody that's worldly and they just, their lives radically transform? It's un, there's nothing like it. Pastor Don, if you want, I'll save that last part. If you want to come on. I was going to, I was going to give you guys one more, but I think I'm out of time on it. You sure? Okay. The last part of this, one of the most powerful things that this has to do with today is called the law of acceleration. And that is when you feel like you're out of time, like I was beginning to feel like right now. <laughs> Thanks, Pastor Donna. She said, <laughs> when you feel like there's just no more time for you to do what God's called you to do, or maybe there's something you've been believing for and you feel like there's no way, it's, it's too late. The process of planting those grape seeds, cultivating the vine, working the land, making sure that the grapes were ripe for the harvest, that could take sometimes several years. And then to put it on the shelf after making the wine, letting it ferment in the aging process to make it the choicest wine could take 50 years. Jesus can do in your life in yeah. one moment what could take a lifetime so yeah. to accomplish. That's the kind of yeah. God we serve. So good. Amen. 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 You're good. Praise God. Praise God. Give God praise tonight. He's good. No, you're not... I thought about so many miracles I thought about I was going to share. Actually, a couple of those I had already picked, 
And then these guys text me, and I said, okay, I'm going to change mine. So I thought, you know, the greatest miracle that I could, it's not in the Old Testament. It's not in the New Testament. It's not in all that we've talked about. The greatest miracle, and I'm going to come down here. The greatest miracle is right here in this room. It's right here in this room. The greatest miracle is in this room. It's you and it's me. And it's the fact that we're here today. It's the fact that we're the greatest miracle, Pastor Darrell, and one of the greatest is you. Is this, this is a miracle. You are setting in a miracle. You are, I know your past. I know your backstory. I know how you were raised. You are a miracle of God. Amen. Brother Phil. Brother Phil. The enemy thought he had you. He thought he had you. Everybody thought he had you. Everybody that knew you, your friends, your family, they thought it's over for Phil. It's over for him. It's over. But God, you are a miracle of God. The fact that we have the ability to be called the sons and daughters of God with our sinful, messed up, crazy self, we have the power to be called the sons of God. Jessica, I see you there. You are a miracle sitting in this place tonight. You are a miracle. God is a miracle-working God, and he's still working miracles. I decorated for fall. Did y'all hear they canceled Halloween this year? Right? I ain't got to preach a sermon on Halloween. Thank you, Jesus. Woo! That's the best thing about COVID-19 so far. I ain't got to preach about it. So I decorated for fall. And so I've got like 25 pumpkins. Really, I do. They're, they're cute. They're cute. They're not jack-o'-lantern. This ain't no jack-o'-lantern, y'all. A, a child of God, a witch and a ghost and a goblin and a jack-o'-lantern ain't got no place in your house, okay? So anyway. So I decorated for fall uh, this past week. I told Pastor Joe, I said, get all my fall stuff down because I, I love fall. I love this time of year. And so he got it all down. He set it on the kitchen table. And I had Emery, my little grand- granddaughter there that day. And uh, I had it was just a mess all on the table. Well, she takes a nap. And when she takes a nap, it's all on the table. Well, when she wakes up, she takes like a two-hour nap. Hallelujah. And um, she's, she's so perfect. And... Um, she woke up and I had the house decorated. I got my pumpkin setting everywhere and I got it all decorated everywhere. And uh, about that time, Papa comes home. And so he comes in the door and he says, Emery, did you help Mimi decorate for fall? She said, yes, Papa. And she said, look, she don't call them pumpkins. She calls them pumpkins. Pumpkins. She said, look, Papa, there's a pumpkin. And she run in the other room. There's a pumpkin. And she run in the TV room. There's a pumpkin. And I mean, I got them everywhere. There's a punt, man. And I thought, I thought tonight, I thought about miracles and the greatest miracle. I thought, there's a miracle. <laughs> Amen. There's a miracle, Sherry. You know what I'm talking about. There's a miracle, Tracy. You know what I'm talking about. There's another miracle. There's another miracle. God is a miracle working God. Look at this scripture. Look at this scripture I want to show you. It's that Luke scripture I gave you, Wayne. Look at that. It says, when he had stopped speaking, he said to Simon, launch out into the deep and let down your nets. Let down your nets for a catch. But Simon answered and said to him, Master, we have toiled all night and caught nothing. Nevertheless, at your word, I will let down the net. What did Jesus tell him to do? He said, let down your nets. He said, nevertheless, I'll let down my net. And when they had done this, they caught a great multitude of fish and their net was breaking and their net was breaking so you know the miracles once we talked about Peter one of the first miracles Jesus did with Peter Jesus goes to him and says let down your nets Peter argues with them and he says never I've, I've done this it didn't work but nevertheless I'll let down my net I'll let down my net and so therefore since they didn't let down the nets plural He let down the net. The net is breaking. So I say all that to say this. You are a miracle setting in this place. Brittany, Brian, you are a miracle setting in this place. The greatest miracle ever. Thank God. And like these uh, men and women were saying, thank God for salvation. That's the greatest miracle ever. But let me tell you something. Pastor, you are a miracle. Central is a miracle. 
but God desires to put an S on your miracle. Amen. He desires to put an S on you, to make it plural. He's not through with you yet, Sherry. He's not through with you yet, Ashley. He's not through yet. He's got so many miracles for us. Amen. We just got to believe him. And like we've already said, we've got to be obedient to the letter. To the letter. Don't leave it. When God tells you, this is what I need you to do, do, like, do what he tells you to do. Let's don't do it halfway. Let's fill it to the rim. Let's go all the way. Amen. Let's go all the way because God desires to do miracles among us. He's not finished. Salvation was just the beginning, Brother Phil. He saved you. You are a miracle, but he's not through with you yet. He's got so much for you to do, so much for us to do. Amen? Amen. Who needs a miracle tonight? Who needs a miracle? Stand to your feet. Stand to your feet right now if you need a miracle in your life. You need it. Come on down here, guys. Come on down. We're going to pray for these people tonight. If you, you know, God already knows. Like I said, a miracle is not always a physical need. Maybe you need a physical healing tonight. But if you just say, look, Pastor Donna, I, there's a situation, and I need a miracle. I need a miracle. I need God to work some things out. We want to pray for you tonight. We want to pray because I believe that can happen in this place tonight. Amen. Do you believe that? You got to believe. You got to believe for it to happen. Amen. That's the, that's the first thing we've got to establish. You have to believe for that thing to happen. So lift your hands. Lift your hands toward heaven tonight. Father, we love you. We praise you. We thank you for your word. We thank you that you are the same yesterday, today, and forever. And Father, we thank you and we praise you that your word is true. You never change. What you did for Peter, what you did for the woman with the issue of blood, what you did for Jairus' daughter, Father, you can do in this place tonight. And Lord, we come to you with our request. We come boldly before your throne and make our petitions known to you tonight. And Father, I ask you in Jesus' name to begin to work a miracle in the situations. Father, you already know the situation. You already know the circumstance. You know things that need to be moved around and changed and, and, and maneuvered. And Father, I ask you in Jesus' name to begin to move in the lives of these people. Begin to put an S on their miracle, Father, that you've already done. Thank you for salvation, Father, but we know there's more for them. We thank you for that. Lord, I ask you now that your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. As it is in heaven. Things are perfect there. Things are, are amazing there. And Father, we ask that now in Jesus' name over every situation. We thank you for that. We thank you. No weapon formed against us shall prosper. We are more than conquerors through Christ Jesus, Father. We glorify you tonight, Lord. Lord, the situation, we give it to you now. We give it to you. We, we press in to you as the woman with the issue of blood. And we thank you, Father, like Ms. Francis, Lord, that whatever ails us, that you are the answer. We praise you for that now. We give you honor and we give you glory for it. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Give God praise tonight. Amen.